Well, let me say way to go church this morning. I did not know what to expect with the 15 minute bump up. If I knew we were going to have this type of crowd, we will do it again next week. And uh, well, maybe that'd be going too far. Way to go. It is great to see all of you this morning. No better way on the planet Earth. I'm going to go ahead and go big than to start your week here at the Park Plaza Church. It is going to be a great day. And I know God's got a word for you today. As I'm in the middle of way to go church, way to go church on another issue, uh, our MAP program, our missionary adoption program that we are running through our classes, way to go. Our missionaries uh, rub elbows with other missionaries that are not supported by this church family. And we get back the word from our missionaries how special it is, your prayers, your cards, your specific ways as classes are doing it in different ways of encouraging our missionaries. And so classes, keep it up. It is making a huge difference in keeping our missionaries encouraged. So go ahead and give yourself a hand this morning on that deal. All right. Give yourself a hand. Come on. Come on. Here we go. I know some of y'all are still trying to wake up this morning and we want to make that happen. And church also, let me say to our men and our men's ministry, a big way to go. Signups are going fantastic for January 26. Alan Robertson, if you're a guest here today, the beardless brother from Duck Dynasty fame will be here and looking forward to being here. He's been here many times before. Then on the 27th that morning, uh, again, another men's ministry event Friday night, bring guests Saturday morning, just the men of our congregation kind of as a football team would huddle up and some plays for this coming year and plans that God has put on our heart and Alan walking us through that. And then also sign ups just almost to capacity for men leading the way and encouraging their wives and as couples coming for on Saturday night the 27th, that evening of marriage blessing. And then we're working Alan on that coming uh, next day, Sunday morning, we're asking him not just to speak once or twice, but go all the way. And we're, we're shooting for four times. The new schedule allows that. And so uh, be praying for Alan Robertson and his strength and endurance as he comes our way. Church, this morning, we're going to go to our Father in prayer, and as we always do, ask him to speak to us this morning. For many of our members, it's been an unusual number of members who have experienced loss this week, uh, loss of a loved one. And so we're going to go to our Father also in prayer on their behalf. Let's pray at this time. Almighty God, uh, we thank you for this day to come. And we're mindful that as we say, this is the day the Lord has made, that we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. That there are some where that rolls off their heart and out of their mouths very easily. There are others that are having to really make a commitment because it's been a tough week. Uh, Father, especially for those who have lost loved ones. So, Father, we continue to remember Mary McAllister and the loss of her husband, Luther. Even this morning as Mary is in the hospital herself. Father, we remember Rob and Ray Lynn as uh, Rob not too long ago losing his father and now his mother. Father, we mourn over the loss of Barbara Spurrier. We pray for the Spurrier family. Father, for Chris and Candace Billings. Father, for the Wheeler family. Father, for Crystal, Candace's sister. Uh, we pray in the loss of a father, of four, and a husband. And Father, we also pray as in many ways our, our city and our entire brotherhood in this state grieve over the loss of Jeff McElroy. We pray for his family today. Father, in all of these losses, we are reminded that this life is short, that we have no promises. Father, for the next decade, Father, this afternoon for that matter, and so we pray that in our short time on this earth that you would teach us how to live. And Father, we rejoice knowing that all those that we pray over this morning, Father, um, they're doing much better today. And we thank you for that, Lord, because of the hope that we have of heaven. It is in Christ's name the church said, amen. Today we come in the gospel of Mark. Go ahead and be turning there if you will. In the Gospel of Mark, we come to a guy who's in the acquisition business. Yet today, he's going to have a problem as we unpack his story again. He's into acquiring, and the thing he wants to acquire today cannot be acquired. Well, it can be, but it has to be given. 
you can't under your own power get a hold of it. It has to be something that is received. This individual has always trusted in himself and not so much in God. And as a result of that, his generosity, his joy quotient, his obedience and ability to follow after God, it has not been what it should be. In fact, we'll see in the story today, it's not only not been what it should be, it's non-existent. And so today we come appropriately so to the story of the rich young ruler. And I say appropriately so because as we continue to just make our way through the gospel of Mark, it is what we do here at this church family more times than not. Every once in a while we'll, we'll visit a topical sermon. We'll talk about marriage. We'll, we'll talk about being a father or a mother. We'll talk about giving or this or that. But more times than not, we just make our way through a book and allow God to speak to us what he would speak to us. And today, uh, the Holy Spirit's timing is unbelievable. Because next week is where we once again, we do it four times a year, every quarter. We do a thing on a Sunday called First and Ten. Because I'll openly confess that uh, I have not been brought up, nor have I uh, contributed to my own well-being and understanding of what it is to be a giver, much less a joyful giver. And so as a congregation, as a church family, four times a year, once a quarter, we take a Sunday to really step out in faith. Now, many of us are going, this is old hat. I've been doing this for decades all my life. But there are some of us who are learning what it is to step out even in faith when it hurts, when it doesn't make sense to the world and give our, well, the first and 10 part, the first, our first fruits and to give a 10th, to give back to God what he's called us to give. And so today we're taking a look at an individual that when he is called to give, he really fails a test. He doesn't do so joyfully. He really doesn't do so at all. And so today we're going to take a look as God's timing would lead us to the story that would help us as we prepare next week to not only step out in faith and give our first fruits, to give a tenth of what God has called us to give, but to do it in a way where we're following Jesus and we're doing it joyfully. Amen, church? Not just doing what Christ called us to do, but doing it in the way in which he called us to do it. And so today, as we talk about receiving and we talk about acquiring and the holiday season now firmly behind us, Roy Fox turned out his Christmas lights the other day. That's the mark that Christmas has done. And now that Christmas is firmly behind us, I came across a site the other day that listed some of the best notes to Santa that kids had comprised this year. I think we've even got them for you on the overhead. Let me help you out with these. Dear Santa, how are you and the reindeer doing? I'm doing fine. I want a new football game and football because my little brother always tries to steal mine. He may look sweet, but he is the devil. <laughs> I also want a remote control truck. Love, Evan. Next one. Dear Santa, you better bring me my pony this year. And on the side next to the pony drawing, or there will be consequences. <laughs> we really are a people that struggle with acquiring things. Dear Santa, how are your reindeer? If you cannot buy what I want, take it easy on yourself. Just give me tens and ones of money. <laughs> Dear Santa Claus, C-L-A-W-S. I love the address before that. Go to the North Pole, all right? I'm so sorry for what I did in the past. And thank you for the Christmas letter. I love it. But what I want for Christmas this year is $53 billion. <laughs> Please write another letter this year. I love you, your friend from Chris. Here's my favorite. Dear Santa Claus, Sup, <laughs> does your workshop smell like up dog? What is up dog you ask? Well, nothing much. How about you zing? <laughs> oh, snap. Well, now that the mood's been lightened up, let's get down to business. <laughs> this year, my heart would tingle if you bought me some Pop-Tarts and Bob Marley Mellow Mood Drink. <laughs> also, I would enjoy having a Hot Topic gift card. Uh, we, we've got a counseling prospect for Neiman there. Uh, this one cuts out. Uh, okay, Santa, he's tried that. To mom, 
all I want for Christmas is an Xbox One S. The price is $299.99 at Walmart. Let's make a deal. If I get this I, and I don't behave, you can send it right back. So it's a win-win. <laughs> Sincerely, Isaac. Okay, now at the bottom, it says this. Sincerely, Isaac, please don't give it to Aaron like you did last year. If you do, I get a hammer and break it outside. <laughs> Smiley face, love you, Isaac. <laughs> and so we can see that in our old nature, there is a problem with receiving correctly and acquiring things, well, acquiring things in a way where the spirit would tell us that God was involved. Sometimes we struggle in our efforts to receive things as Christ would have us receive them. So in our story today, before we get to the text, to set up this larger story in context, Jesus has come upon the scene and in Mark, the children begin to come to him. And it's interesting how many times the word children is used, not just some pronoun, not just some allusion to the world, but, but children come to him. And then the disciples begin to rebuke them. Oh, no, 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 this is a busy guy. He's, he's uh, important to keep the children away. And then Jesus says in an indignant manner, let the children come to me. Over and over again, children and the children and the children. And now the children come to him and he uses them as a springboard to teach a lesson. He says, anyone who would enter the kingdom of God needs to know that the kingdom belongs to such as these, these children. And you need to know that if you want to receive the kingdom of God that belongs to them, no one will receive it unless you receive it like these children. And then Jesus takes, I think it's the fifth time it's used, the children, he begins to take them in his arms and he begins to just call the children all the more to him. In the midst of this, he is about to set out. Your translation may say before he left, as he was setting out. So he's still in the same place. We haven't up and moved to, oh, now we're down by the Dead Sea. We're still in this region and the children, if you can even, see them now beginning to move off and play, but they're still in the setting of the story. And in this setting, this other individual, this rich young ruler, comes up to Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined to sketch out this character um, just as good or better, in fact, I should say, than any other person that Jesus encounters. I, I, you know, save those that are around him all the time. For a one-stop individual, this guy's personality and what we know about him is in full. This rich young ruler, synagogue ruler, young, and the fact that he's young and a synagogue ruler at this stage in life means that he is brilliant beyond compare. His wealth, the original language, he's not wealthy. He is exceedingly wealthy. He is one that is esteemed. He's even in some type of shape. He runs up to Jesus. He's been good at yoga. He plops down on his knees. And so this wealthy, in shape, young guy, respected by the community, even seeking out Jesus. I mean, if you have a daughter that is, you know, looking for a husband and you're the dad of that daughter and this guy shows up at your door, you could be thinking to yourself, we could be doing worse. This guy, well, you know, the wealth or you're into materialism, oh, no, he's seeking out Jesus. He comes up to Jesus and calls him good teacher. This is not the, the, the bad guy in the story or the mean guy in culture. And as he comes to Jesus on his knees and calls him good, Jesus responds by saying, why do you call me good? Because only God is good. And then he begins to go on. He plays off the question that this man asked on his knees. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, this guy doesn't even hesitate when he says, oh, I've done all that. And I just didn't do all that last week or in these first years of young adulthood. I, I've done that since I was a kid. And Jesus, I wonder if he's trying to hold back either the tears or the laughter to that response. Says this in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. And Jesus looking at him, loved him 
You would almost expect today in our culture someone would be looked at him and was, was indignant. How dare you say you've kept all the commandments since you were a youth? Who do you think you are? And, and Christ in grace, Jesus in love, looks at him and he loves him and he says to him, you lack one thing. Oh man, this guy's excited. Not two, not three, not a list. It's just one more thing I've got to acquire. One more thing I've got to get a hold of to inherit eternal life. What must I do? Man, what a great response. One thing. And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Disheartened by this saying, this rich young ruler went away sorrowful. He went away sad. For he had great possessions. Number one thing we want to look at this morning is the rich young ruler had an idol problem. And in the midst of his idolatry, in love and because of love, Jesus deals with it. No doubt that wealth was a part of his idolatry problem. It says because he had great possessions. It's a commentary on one reason why he goes away sad. But there's an earlier clue to the heart of his idolatry problem. When he says, what must I do? His ability, his ability to see plans through, his power, his prestige, his popularity had always brought rewards, had always brought a pat on the back, had brought riches. His I do, can do spirit had taken him far. His idol is self-sufficiency. And Jesus leads him to the one place where his idol of self-sufficiency, his I do, will turn into I don't. Jesus is very specific. Notice how specific Jesus can get in dealing with an idol. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, the Philippian jailer says almost verbatim the same thing. What must I do to be saved? You can almost read it out. What must I do to inherit, to grasp eternal life? And on that one, the Holy Spirit through the group there, through Paul, gives the answer that we love. Believe in the Lord, Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. That's what you've got to do to be saved. Acts 16 and 30, cookie cutter, let's use it all the time. And then all of a sudden we've got this story in Mark and it says not so fast. Because Jesus himself, when the same question is asked, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus, it's easy. I mean, in a little while, Paul's going to get it right. You got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus doesn't go with that. Jesus goes in dealing with a specific idol. Jesus says you need to go and sell all you have. You need to give that to the poor. Treasures in heaven will follow. And then the big thing, the reason you need to do that is you need to come and you need to follow me. This morning, let me ask, what is the thing in your life that's in the way of you following God with all your heart? You know, we, we kind of go sometimes to those, you know, bad things, you know, oh, oh, money and possessions. You know, none of these things in and of themselves are bad. It's just when they get out of order. Job being out of control. Even kids today, many people, their own children become the gods of their life. Kids are great. Job is great. Possessions are great. Money is great. But they are poor gods. Is there anything getting in the way of you coming and following Jesus? The rich young ruler had his wealth life. He had his synagogue ruler life. He has his community life. But when it comes into contact with Christ being Lord over all, that's where things begin to break down and his idol begins to show. You know, Dr. Kenneth Boa, who has spoken here before on several occasions, many of us going through his book, Conform to His Image, in that book has this graph. If you'd go ahead and bring that up. And he says, here is a compartmentalized life. And it's a good definition. It's a good description of what idolatry looks like. Go ahead and fill in any one of those bubbles with that, whatever you want to fill it in with. Your, your uh, going to the gym life, your financial life, your married life, your raising kids life, and, you know, hobby life, whatever it may be. And then you got your Jesus life. There's a time in my life where I live like this. I was a Bible major at a Christian university and I had my Jesus life. But then I had my intramural athletic life. I know that's hard to believe that that life once existed for me, but, but I had that. 
And boy, I'd get out there on that intramural field and language would begin to flow, language that I won't share today. I'm ashamed of that. I mean, a Bible major out there with an attitude, even when the language didn't flow, I mean, there was an attitude that, well, well no, 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 that, this is okay because this is on the ball field and that's Jesus stuff. You go, Mitch, that's horrible. Have you ever been to a Church of Christ softball game when Churches of Christ play each other? <laughs> you go, what is going on here? It's a great illustration of how men who are deacons and elders and disciples of Christ can have their Jesus life, but now this is baseball life, you know? And this is, and you go, oh, well, yeah, let's use those guys as an example. Go down to Dallas today and drive down, you know, Highway 75 and LBJ. And that's my Jesus life, and this is my Dallas traffic life. And we begin to act differently. This next graph, Boa, gets to what our lives should look like. Jesus is not at the top and everything else down below, and they have their compartmentalized segments. But it is Jesus flowing out. It is Jesus in charge of everything. It is Jesus saying, come and follow me when you're rooting for your kids there at that ball game. When you're driving through traffic, when you're doing your taxes, when you're being honest and filled with integrity, or the temptation comes to not be. What is the idol? What is the compartmentalization happening where Jesus today... Just like with a Philippian jailer, there's this generic call that is an <laughs> accurate call. Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. But then there is also this specific call of to you, and it may not be go and sell. It may be love your wife. It may be forgive your enemy. It may be reconnect with your kids. It may be lay down your grudges. It may be stop stealing. It may be get back to work. It may be do right. In all of this, in this idol life, we see a problem that the rich young ruler has. Number two, the rich young ruler has a joy problem. He is the only guy in Scripture. Now, others leave Jesus' presence uh, mad. They leave confused. They leave bewildered by his teaching, unable to wrap their minds around it. But this guy comes, it appears, happy and no doubt leaves sad. And the sad thing is, is when you've got an idol problem, you also have a joy problem. And there are many today that as we point the finger at him and we go, how can you come into the presence of Jesus and leave sad? There are many, many thousands of churches today where people will come into the presence of the living Lord and they won't leave any happier than when they came. In fact, some will manage some how to leave sad or distraught or sorrowful. Great illustration. Presbyterian minister decides that this is a problem in his parish, in his church. And so with a very high church culture, pretty buttoned up crowd, um, one Sunday morning, he has all of the ushers as people enter, hand out helium balloons. And everybody, wouldn't this be great? Everybody gets a helium balloon. Can you imagine? And with hundreds of members, they're all holding their helium balloon. And some already showed up a little bit happy, but now they're really not happy because mm, what is this? And he explains to them at the very beginning of the service, he says, we're going to be here one hour. He says, when you feel the joy of Jesus, I want you to let your balloon go. Now, some of you are already ahead of me. Service began, and they began to sing about the joy of the Lord, and a balloon went up. And a couple minutes later, a balloon went up. And a couple minutes later, a balloon went up. But the crazy thing is, is one hour later, most of the balloons were still being held by people who are now deeply wondering about a service that they would never forget the rest of their lives because they were wondering what they were doing in the presence of a God who said, I'll take the cross so you don't have to. I'll take it for your neighbors. I'll take it for your kids. I'm going to give you heaven instead, and you have no business deserving it. And yet, in the presence of that gift, they're going, where's my joy? Today, church, if you got an idol problem, you may have a joy problem. And Jesus is calling you today to let that idol go. And he's going to get specific about it. He's not just going to say to you, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is amen, amen, and amen truth. But it also may be your tradition. Well, I just, I, I wasn't raised that way. 
Brothers and sisters, break the cycle and stop raising your kids that way. Be someone that when your kids look at you, they look at their father and they look at their mother and they go, it's not just head knowledge. It is moved from here to here and my dad and my mom are different. And kids, some of us old folks can struggle with this. I pray to God that this youth ministry would show us what it is to let your balloon go because you're experiencing the joy of the Lord and you do that by letting your idols go. It may not be tradition with you. You may be in the midst of some, some sin that none of us know about. That's the way sin goes. We, we sadly live in dark places. And Christ today is calling you to be done with that, go and sell that, and take hold of what he has in store for you. Let's read together in Mark chapter 10 and verse 23. You're aware that everything we're doing in Mark now is in the last six months of Jesus' life. And he's speaking to his disciples. So he takes this whole run in with the rich young ruler to now look just at his disciples. And I kind of picture the kids still playing in the background, still wondering when Jesus is going to be done with this teaching stuff so they can run up and get in his arms again. Because he didn't get on his journey. It was kind of as he was setting out, he, he was stopped by this rich young ruler. And now turning to his disciples, he says this, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And now they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, it's not. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, now, now we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, here comes a big amen true. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, brothers or sisters or mother or father, children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Third point this morning is this, the rich young ruler has also his entire life with his idols and lack of joy had a confidence problem. He has put his confidence in the wrong things. He has put his confidence in the same things that we put or the same thing that many times we put our confidence in and it is in ourself. Our world, our nation tells you, you can do anything. That's hogwash. There's a ton of things you can't do. You can't, uh, you can't tickle yourself. Uh, you can't, uh, I don't think you can lick your elbow. You can't sneeze with your eyes open. You can't slam a revolving door. Story I told probably 20 years ago when I was first dating Shannon, we we're on a mission trip out to Los Angeles. On a day off, we end up at this place. You ever heard of this place? Ripley's Believe It or Not. They got stories of the tallest man in the world, the guy with the longest fingernails, all this stuff, longest beard. And I walk in this one room, I ask for your apologies on the telling this story again, but it gets to my point of how foolish you can look when you think you can do all things. I walk in this one room shaped like a rectangle about as big as this stage, one whole wall, nothing but mirrors, little podium there. Half of Americans can't roll their tongue. I was there. I had finally come to a place where I knew that I was going to set myself apart, and I began to roll my tongue. Okay. And, I, and I enjoy this story as a speaker because I watch all of you right now <laughs> with your mouth shut trying to be dignified. Next podium. Half of Americans can't fold their tongue back, and only 10% can do both. This was my day. I knew I was special, that God had made me different. And I folded my tongue. I looked in that mirror. I was even showing it to some of my friends on that mission trip campaign. I proceeded in the next few moments to do things with my tongue that had never been considered by man before. 
And I was in that mirror showing off. I walked out of that room feeling so proud of myself. I began to take an odd series of right turns, feeling as if I was going back into that room. But what actually happened was, is I was coming to a room immediately adjacent to it, and I heard laughing in that room. And as I came up upon that room, the laughing got louder and I quickened my pace to get in there and join in on the laughter. And one man I did not know then pointed at me and he goes, there he is, (laughs) here he comes. And I walked into a room and I saw nothing but windows with people making complete fools of themselves with their tongues. (laughs) And that two way mirror got the best of me. There are times in life where we believe we can do anything and we end up just looking silly. We've got a confidence problem. What we need to do is take a look at the face of God and the truth of God and understand something far more profound than licking your elbow or sneezing with your eyes open or slamming revolving doors is at stake here. Jesus says, you can't save yourself. On your best day, you're not even close Oh, I've had some righteous days, God. Filthy rags. Well, then where do I stand? What Paul would say, I have no more confidence in the flesh. But I now place my confidence in God. And what is impossible with man is now possible with God. Well, how do I get there? Bring up that next focus in on Scripture, if you will. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus begins to talk to the disciples, a word that he has never directly referred to them as before or will so again, he employs. In the midst of a context where he is just taught on, you gotta be children to receive it. You gotta be children to receive it. And he just keeps driving the word home. Children, 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 receive it. You'll never get the kingdom unless you receive it but I can do all things. You'll never get the kingdom unless you receive it like a child. And then a story that we sometimes separate, but should not be separated with a rich young ruler. Jesus then looks at these disciples and he says, children, children, how difficult it will be to enter the kingdom of God unless children, you receive it. Today, let us as children, let the Holy Spirit's truth break and shatter our hearts again, where now we stand before him, idols of self-confidence and self-sufficiency gone, wholly depending upon him, leading us into a joy unexplained, and now the impossible becomes possible because we're counting on him. Last thing this morning. Has this language, Mitch, in the Bible ever been used before about nothing is impossible with God? The most joy-filled place in Scripture where Jesus is coming to earth, none other than Emmanuel himself, and the birth at Bethlehem. Luke 1 and 37 says this, For nothing will be impossible with God. Let us be people who turn to him, Let us be people who understand that when we put our confidence in him, just as Christ was born at Bethlehem, Christ through the Holy Spirit can be born in us through the Holy Spirit and by means of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit flowing from that, Christ even in us today, in us, us in him, Our confidence in his saving grace, in his ability to take what is meant for us and make it his and give us his perfect life. Today, may the joy of that knowledge flow in us and from us. Today, if there is an idol, you don't even want it named. You just want prayers of the church to remove it. Maybe today you want to come and name it and have it done with and out in the open and exposed. And we can pray for that and be encouraged by that. Or today you want to come and just acknowledge, I don't know, to your bride, to your children, to your parents, to a brother in accountability and say, I've been going to church for 40 years. And what's really getting me is if Mitch had handed out balloons today, I might still be hanging on to mine. And I don't want to hang on to it anymore. And I want to begin to take that crazy walk into, can you believe this? 
today, if you want to just kind of begin to muddle into that walk, Jesus says, go sell that past and come and follow me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm the one who invented joy. Today, will you come as we stand and as we sing?